This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. When you sign up at the link in the description, you also get access to Nebula, a streaming video service that City Beautiful is a part of. Back in 2009, New York City closed off Broadway to vehicles at Times Square on a temporary basis. The change made sense as Times Square was often packed with pedestrians, tourists mainly, who wanted to check out the famous New York landmark. The experiment was a success and they made it permanent in 2014. The Times Square pedestrian redesign is one of the most visible examples of a trend in the United States that is taking street space originally for cars and giving it back to pedestrians. I know I need a second to acknowledge our friends from non-US countries. We know your cities are much better for pedestrians, but we're doing our best over here with our unique history and land use pattern. Anyway, lots of cities have recently begun building new pedestrian spaces, and some have even shut down streets to traffic. But there's a shadow cast over all of these projects. The shadow of doubt cast from the failed pedestrian malls of the 1960s and 1970s. In fact, the New York Times wrote, the pedestrian mall, the urban planner's failed attempt to revitalize Main Streets during the 1960s and 1970s, is back, about the Times Square plan. If you look at these new pedestrian projects, cities are careful not to call them pedestrian malls. Instead, they call them plazas or squares to avoid the comparison to the black sheep of pedestrian spaces. Everyone has this vaguely negative connotation associated with pedestrian malls in the 1960s and 1970s, but were they really failures? Should we be worried about building new pedestrian spaces? And what can we learn from these old pedestrian malls? Okay, it's time for a story. Let's learn the legend of the pedestrian mall. Once upon a post-war, young families moved to the suburbs thanks to the affordability and convenience of the car. Once there, they didn't want to go back downtown to shop. Instead, shopping came to them in the form of strip malls and shopping centers designed with the car in mind. Shoppers loved to drive to the mall, park, and walk past the shops in a clean, climate-controlled setting. Downtown shop owners, faced with declining sales in empty downtowns, needed a way to lure shoppers back to the center city. Victor Gruen, the architect responsible for designing the first suburban shopping mall, had an idea to close shopping streets to cars and create a kind of outdoor mall downtown. Kalamazoo, Michigan was the first city to take Gruen up on his idea, and the first pedestrian mall opened on Burdick Street in 1959. Initially deemed a success, other communities began installing malls on their main streets. The idea particularly appealed to smaller cities, as pedestrian malls were relatively quick and inexpensive to install. Cities all over the U.S. installed malls in the 1960s and 1970s, but they quickly realized that the malls were ruthlessly killing downtown businesses, and nearly all cities removed them. Today, pedestrian malls are a cautionary tale. Don't remove cars from a street unless you want businesses to fail. Okay, so this is a bit of a simplification and dramatization, but I think it's a pretty fair short summary of the narrative around pedestrian malls. At least this was the narrative I found when I started doing my research two years ago. This video is really special to me because it's about my research that I got published in a journal. I wanted to write an article about pedestrian spaces, and when I started doing my research on pedestrian malls, I noticed something that kind of shocked me. Nobody really knew how many pedestrian malls there were, how many had failed, and how many are still remaining. That seems like important information to know if you want to declare something a failure, but nobody had really any idea at all. Part of the reason nobody had a number is because there are so many different definitions of what a pedestrian mall is. Are transit malls pedestrian malls? They get rid of cars, but allow buses and trains to use the central space. What about a boardwalk along the shore? No cars there. If I was going to count all the pedestrian malls built in that era, I had to have a clear definition. Here's what I came up with. A pedestrian mall is a street where private motorized traffic has been permanently eliminated and pedestrians have priority. This specifies that the street has to have allowed cars in the past, eliminating boardwalks and plazas from our definition. The pedestrians have priority part eliminates transit malls. While not in the definition, I limited my count to streets closed to cars in downtown areas, not on random suburban streets. This study is about pedestrian malls designed and built in the urban renewal era in response to suburbanization. Armed with a workable definition, I set to work cataloging all of the pedestrian malls. I quickly realize why we don't have an exact number already. It's really hard to find all of them. There are some existing catalogs, but most are from the 1970s, so they don't get all of the malls. There were some other lists too, but they didn't all use my definition, and some had inaccuracies. For example, many lists regard Sacramento's pedestrian mall as removed, because in 1987 it was converted into a transit mall, and later opened to traffic but not all of it was removed. Here's some proof. A perfectly fine existing pedestrian mall, lined with restaurants and an IMAX theater. So I set to work cross-referencing all of the existing lists, trying to verify details on local news websites designed in 1997, 
and finding some malls nobody had listed as well. When all was said and done, I found 140 pedestrian malls that were built between 1959 and 1985 and met my definition. Here's a map of where they are. Lots clustered around Kalamazoo, actually, and a fair number out west, too. And here's a graph of when they were installed. You can see that 1970 to 1974 is peak pedestrian mall, and it kind of trails off after that. By the late 70s, cities began removing their pedestrian malls. We're still removing malls, actually. Victor Gruen designed another mall in Fresno, California that was removed a couple years back. I have an old video on that. Go check it out. Before I forget, I published a list of all of the pedestrian malls I found on a Google Doc. I posted a link to it in the description. If you have any information to add to my list, please email me. The article may be published, but I wanted to keep adding malls and mall information as I can find it. I think it will be a useful resource to anyone doing research on this topic. Okay, so 140 malls were built, and a lot of them were removed. How many of them still remain? 45, it turns out. I don't know what your reaction to that number is, but I was surprised that so many were left. That's nearly a third. I mean, how many pro sports stadiums built in the 60s and 70s are we still using today? How many shopping malls built during that era are we still using today? I am absolutely willing to concede that pedestrian malls are not the right urban design tool to shore up declining downtown retail sales, but I'd argue that was an impossible task. Demographics and migration made it impossible to compete at the time. What could a small city have built that could have competed against the local shopping mall? Probably nothing. And despite this, 45 malls still survived and are alive and kicking. Well, not all of them are kicking. A few are pretty dead, like this one in Redding, California. But others, a majority actually, are really vibrant spaces, like the Ped Mall in Iowa City, Iowa, Pearl Street in Boulder, Colorado, or the Main Street Mall in Charlottesville, Virginia. If you are really perceptive, you might have noticed that each of these are college towns, and you might be thinking, that's why they're still around. There are plenty of college students to keep them feeling lively and keep the shops, restaurants, and bars in business. I noticed this too and did some more research about why some pedestrian malls are still around and why others were removed. I found some interesting things. First of all, pedestrian malls within one mile of a college campus were more likely to survive than those not near a college campus. So college students probably do help. Malls built in warm climates like those found in Florida, Hawaii, and California are more likely to be around than the overall average. Nearly 60% of these malls are still around. And pedestrian malls built in larger cities did better than those in small towns, particularly in cities that gained population during the mall's existence. Cities that lost population also lost their mall most of the time. So it turns out that pedestrian malls and downtown shops both rely on the same thing, foot traffic. If a pedestrian mall is near a big source of pedestrians like college campuses, beaches, or tourist attractions, they feel vibrant and lively. Nice weather gets people outside and keeps them walking longer into the winter months. Pedestrian malls can't generate foot traffic on their own, though, which is why they can't be used to save downtown retail. They are best used in places where there already is a lot of foot traffic. So that should really be the big takeaway here. Unless your city is installing a pedestrian mall or square or plaza or whatever to save a declining retail street, you don't have to worry about the legacy of old pedestrian malls. They're public spaces just like these new ones being built, and are reliant on sources of pedestrians to keep them lively. It's time to stop thinking about pedestrian malls as a cautionary tale, but instead think of them as elder state spaces of the public realm. So I recently did a viewer survey, thanks to all who participated, and when I asked about who else you all watch on YouTube, I saw a lot of people mentioning creators like Wendover Productions, CGP Grey, Real Engineering, and Lindsay Ellis. Did you know that me, all of those creators, and many other educational creators teamed up to build Nebula? a streaming video service for education and content. We also teamed up with the fantastic documentary video service CuriosityStream to bundle a subscription to Nebula and CuriosityStream for one low annual subscription price of $19.99 or $2.99 per month. For that price, you get CuriosityStream's vast library of high-quality documentary films by the likes of Stephen Hawking, David Attenborough, Jane Goodall, and more. And you're also supporting dozens of high-quality educational creators on Nebula. Many of these creators are putting out Nebula Originals, special series that you can only get over on that service. There's a great series going on right now where different creators discuss their favorite movie and TV intro sequences. To get both amazing streaming video services for an exceedingly low price, visit curiositystream.com citybeautiful. It's probably the best deal in online video you can get right now, and it supports so many great independent creators, including City Beautiful. So thanks for considering it.